Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the Noon. I'm your host this evening, Lawrence Ray. And today I'm joined by my esteemed co hosts, uh, Ricardo Martinez and Jerry. And today we are interviewing the amazing Jameson Lock. And uh, Jameson, before I ask how you're doing, I'll uh, give you a quick intro to our audience, if anyone who hasn't heard of you or come across you so far. So, Jameson is the uh, CEO and co founder of Casa, uh, a cypherpunk, uh, Bitcoin Times editor. Uh, creator of some pretty useful beginner Bitcoin resources um, and overall privacy advocate. So uh, how are you doing today, Jameson? I'm doing well, hanging in there, uh, just trying to start to enjoy some uh, summer sun and uh, you know, watching the loft lockdowns all get lifted, uh, taking advantage of that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm partying. For, well, I mean, yeah, it's been delayed a bit in the UK, but overall, right direction everywhere. So that's uh, positive for sure. But yeah, I guess, uh, well, we'll just dig in and sort of start asking you questions straight off the bat. So um, the, one of the first things um, I guess I wanted to bring up um, was something that's been in the news a lot recently. Uh, and I'm nearly sick of talking about it, but not quite, which is uh, El Salvador. Um, and yeah, essentially, it's all over the, the Bitcoin news world specifically at the moment, and rightfully so. Um, but I guess one thing I wanted to sort of speak about was just like getting your um, thoughts on when it was announced that El Salvador was going to kind of bring on Bitcoin as legal tender, and then kind of like how that may have changed or developed uh, over the last kind of couple of weeks, as we've seen the developments with the president and the volcano power and all these different things. Um, I just wanted to see kind of, yeah, what, what you thought about it originally and, and how that's changed. Well, interestingly enough, I went back through my tweets because I felt like it was a momentous enough event that I had probably talked about something like this happening before. And I actually had a tweet about four years ago in which I made a bold prediction that there would be a nation state that uh, essentially set Bitcoin as their currency. And I, at the time, I said, I think it'll happen in the next five years. I was probably feeling pretty bullish at the time. Um, and, uh, you know, just by sheer luck uh, it happened you know within the time frame that i had guessed but my my main point with all of that is like i felt like it was inevitable obviously you know predicting timelines on these things is very hard but it it's a logical thing to do especially if you're a tiny little nation that is essentially at the whim of other nations or uh, large central banking organizations that are essentially uh, holding you hostage. Uh, you know, if you're not large enough and powerful enough to have your own currency, then it makes sense to choose a currency that is more predictable, that uh, is more favorable uh, towards you and, and your citizens. So from that standpoint, I felt like we we're kind of overdue for it. Um, I think it, it was actually a little bit surprising that it was El Salvador, which is, I mean, they're not a large country, but they're also not one of the smallest. I, I kind of assumed it would be a micro nation of some sort, you know, basically really bottom of the ladder type of nation that's like barely even recognized as a nation. But, um, you yeah, know, I think this is a very interesting development because it makes the other nations that are in similar situations start to take notice. And, you know, it's, it's really how you get the ball rolling on this type of stuff. Uh, once the dominoes start falling, you know, that's when I think macro changes are really going to start happening. And, and even more than just the announcement itself, um, the reaction in the days after and really the actions of the president to, to go further than just simply make a empty proclamation. He's actually putting resources into this. I think we're going to see actual boots on the ground type of action uh, to try to form uh, you know, grassroots movements uh, within this uh, nation to get as many people as possible onboarded to the world's most sound money. And, 
you know, it's not going to be easy. It's going to take a lot of work, but you know, if this is a success and we can create a reproducible model for it, then I think you're going to see a lot of Bitcoiners start to go out uh, to other nations and essentially offer to help uh, reproduce that and onboard uh, many, many more people. Now there's, you know, there's going to be a lot of technical challenges, educational challenges and whatnot, but I think that this is the type of thing that a lot of us have been waiting to see. It's a one small step, but one giant leap forward. Yeah, that's a good way to summarize it at the end there. And yeah, I, it's something that I, I kind of felt might be a few years on from now, but so it kind of surprised me. Um, I, I think the other thing that surprised me is like the um, the speed and efficacy at which like he's act, the president's actually acted on it. Essentially, it's like, yeah, Bill's going through. And it was like, oh, okay. I, I didn't expect it to be that fast, which has just impressed me basically, um, to be honest. Now, of course, this, this may be a result of some attributes of El Salvador that are perhaps uh, less uh, desirable for a lot of us uh, liberty-minded people. You know, whenever whenever I see a government that's able to take really, really swift action, it makes me suspect that it's probably more on the authoritarian side. Uh, so, you know, this isn't... I, I think this is what you're seeing a lot of pushback from uh, uh, people talking about El Salvador and the problems that they have and how this is bad for Bitcoin that they're trying to do this stuff. But I think that those of us who understand the system reasonably well, we understand that you know the actual technology, it's a tool, it's neutral, it can be used for good things and bad things. And you know we're going to keep an, an eye on it and and see you know exactly how this gets rolled out in the country but uh you know just because there may be some people with questionable backgrounds or whatever using it that does not at all detract from the utility uh the 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 value of this protocol it it kind of all goes back down to one of the original i guess concerns that a lot of people have about bitcoin which is that it's good for criminals but uh, you know my pushback to that is that uh, at the end of the day we're all criminals one way or another you just choose your flavor of criminality speaking of criminals did you ever get to the bottom of who swatted you and were the perpetrators ever brought to justice not really um so suffice to say I got a number of clues, uh, uh, some good leads came in, um, but it was never enough, I think, to actually get law enforcement to step in. And, you know, the, the burden of proof uh, is pretty high on a lot of these things. And I think the short version is, my interactions with law enforcement basically led me to come to the understanding that I was not a high priority. Um, you know, they're, they're more concerned with people who are in imminent danger or uh, people who are you know, serial major criminals that are, you know, basically stealing millions of dollars uh, from lots of folks and, I did not fit in that category. So the only thing that I can really hope for at this point is karma that, you know, if whoever is out there, this is not the only bad thing that they've done. I suspect that uh, this is kind of the life that they live and that eventually it's going to catch up to them. There's a situation where obviously you've been swatted before and obviously anyone who's listening um, that has occurred just in case anyone didn't, wasn't aware. Um, I know that obviously we're, uh, with the way that you've been since or has been to kind of um, focus a lot on privacy and safeguarding your data and your personal information, which makes sense to me. Um, but I guess there's people out there who probably will be listening and think, well, you know, it's not happened to me. I've not had anything really bad happen to me. Um, essentially, why should I care about my my privacy to the to the similar level or even half the level that, that you do um why should i make an effort basically um and i didn't know if there was any kind of words of wisdom or, or warning that you had for people who may think well you know like i don't need to worry i've not got tons of cash or it's not happened to me yet um i didn't know there's anything you kind of would have to say to those people basically after the experiences that you've been through uh, in your life well you know my 
particular situation was an extreme case. Obviously, only a very tiny portion of the population is ever going to have a SWAT team show up at their house because they're being extorted and targeted by some criminal on the internet. However, there are many, many other things that can go wrong with regard to having privacy leaks. And this is really just common cyber hygiene, cybersecurity is that over a long enough period of time, it's basically a guarantee that any information that you're sharing with other service providers, you know, other websites, other apps, whatever, some of that is going to leak. Uh, some of those databases are going to get compromised. Uh, ultimately, that data is going to end up getting sold on various darknet markets. Uh, it may even just get simply dumped into the public. And then the, the question becomes, uh, what is going to happen as a result of that? I think the most common thing that happens is identity theft. You know, if your personally identifiable information gets leaked, then savvy criminals will be able to essentially leech off of your uh, credit and, you know, pretend to be you, um, open up various lines of credit and, uh, that will be a very long and arduous process for you to try to clean up. It can easily take years uh, to clean up that type of mess. So I think just from a, a simple uh, protective type of perspective, if you just limit the amount of data that you're putting out there in the first place, that's really the best thing that you can do to prevent a whole slew of things that you may not even be thinking about that can go wrong. You know, the stuff that I talk about is more extreme and edge case. Um, my, my type of threats that I'm trying to protect against are, are not your, your sort of garden variety scammers, but if you at least understand how this information can get propagated and used against you, then perhaps you will be a bit more judicious in handing out your data all over the place. Unfortunately, you know, this takes work. Um, there are a variety of different levels uh, that you can end up at of how much effort you want to put into it. But I tell people the very, the simplest thing you can do is um, not put out your real information if it's at all necessary. I would say like 95% of the forms you come across on the internet are asking you for things like telephone numbers and physical addresses and stuff that is not even necessary. Uh, they just wanna collect that information perhaps because they can monetize it later. So like the vast majority of time, if you can't leave something blank and you absolutely have to fill out a form, you can put fake information in there. It's uh, not illegal to do that. Um, in many cases, it's not even illegal to give uh, pseudonyms, you know, fake names, um, unless you're signing a legal contract or unless you are actually engaged where your counterparty is some sort of government entity then it's usually perfectly uh, legal for you to lie about your name and identity and, and whatnot. And, you know, that's sort of getting into the misinformation, disinformation type of thing. But like I said, if, if you're not giving your real information away, then it can't be used against you. So, you know, people will have to decide what their own threat level is, how paranoid they want to be. But I consider it to be like an insurance policy. And the example that I uh, usually give is, uh, for example, there was a, a woman, she was a social media manager and she was flying, I think, from New York to South Africa. And as she boarded the flight to South Africa, she posted uh, a somewhat racist tweet. It was you know, not in a very good taste, but she thought she was being funny. And then when she woke up 12 hours later, that one tweet had gone viral. And even though she only had like 200 followers, that one tweet had pissed off like 10 million people and had resulted in actual you know, physical repercussions where people showed up at the airport uh, to watch her get off the plane. Other people started harassing her and her family and her employer. She ended up getting fired. 
and and so the the reason that I bring that up is just to show that there's this um, there's an asymmetry today due to the information age where you can go from being a nobody to being a somebody that has the ire of tens of millions, if not billions of people directed at you overnight uh, because of, you know, a couple hundred characters that you put out onto the internet. Um, so that's why it's, it's so difficult, I think, to try to tell people what their threat uh, level should be because any of us who are on the internet, who are on social media, uh, who are putting information out there that could be potentially consumed by billions of people, uh, we are in a position where something like that could happen to us. And it is kind of a lottery thing. You know, I think the vast majority of people won't have that happen to them. So if you treat this as sort of a, an insurance policy, then I think the question really comes down to, you know, how much effort do I want to put into protecting myself from these various edge case risks? Hard to quantify, but uh, it can happen. And I was one of the unfortunate lottery winners. <laughs> yeah, I guess one of the examples I, I, I can think of as well would be like the ledger breach, for example, where people just innocently buying a hardware wallet, nothing crazy. And then some of the repercussions of that have been pretty pretty horrific really to be honest i mean with some of the threats and, and things that people have gotten um so that's a kind of i guess an example for the everyday person like hey it can happen and it can compromise quite a lot yeah yeah nobody thinks about oh i'm buying something off the internet and getting it shipped to my house and this is a threat <laughs> you know uh it's it's a it's definitely a new paradigm that people are not used to and um this is, this is just how it goes, I think, with technology making things much more convenient. Uh, the vast majority of people are just going to rush headlong into using whatever is placed before them without taking an adversarial perspective of, well, what could go wrong? As someone who's put a lot of time and energy into becoming very knowledgeable about privacy and security, what would you say is like the best takeaway for someone that's new to the topic? I think that people can get overwhelmed, especially if they start digging into some of the things that I've posted, because most of what I talk about is the extreme edge case. Um, and like I said, it is, uh, it is a spectrum and you don't have to just dive into the deep end of going uh, extreme mountain ban off the grid type of thing where you're protecting yourself from absolutely everything. Um, it's possible to just spend a few hours uh, just trying to improve one small aspect of your privacy and see how that goes. Try to you know, set up various things to automate protecting your privacy, you know, even, even just something as simple as installing a bunch of ad blockers in your browser will get you pretty far ahead uh, compared to a lot of other people. You know, that will at least help protect you from a lot of the surveillance uh, capitalism that happens just as you're doing your day-to-day -day web browsing. You know, going further to the extreme of trying to protect your home address is a lot trickier because then really for for any type of privacy you have to set up some sort of proxy or some sort of intermediary that essentially acts as a shield between you and your real information and the rest of the world and doing that type of stuff for internet uh type of proxies is simple you know if you want to protect you know your actual internet connection you can get a vpn set up and that doesn't take uh, a ton of work or you can you know set up new accounts new emails whatever you know we're just talking about a few clicks uh at that point but once it comes into the the world of uh the physical things that's when i would say the amount of effort and resources required really start to ramp up so you know if you want to protect your home uh, when it comes to getting things shipped to you, then you have to go get uh, 
a box somewhere else that's not in your home. And you know, that's going to cost you money anywhere from probably 50 to over a hundred dollars a month to start receiving packages on your behalf. Uh, even more if you set it up far away and it's remailing stuff to another address. But, um, most of the time, um, I tell people, you know, check out the privacy resources on my website. You can start off with some beginner stuff and just keep chipping away at it at your own pace. Um, for me, I did dive into the deep end. I would say I basically burned down my entire life and started it over again, which was a very intensive uh, process, you know, both for my time and money and other resources. But you can learn from me doing it the hard way and figure out, you know, which pieces of uh, the puzzle would you like to attack? See how that goes. Um, if you get used to it and you're, you're feeling hungry to do even more, there's always more that you can do. Yeah, I suppose there's like a, there's a trade-off, isn't there, with privacy between like convenience and privacy. Like, and obviously there's a scale, which I'm sure many people would kind of want to be really private, but not kind of take those last steps to, you know, completely destroy any kind of convenience, I guess, in their lives. And other people may want to go the full way or whatever it may be. Um, I guess it's a personal, personal preference and decision. Something, and you mentioned uh, the different resources that you have online that you've made. And uh, one of them, for example, Bitcoin page was something that I was given when I first got into Bitcoin. Um, and it was like, you know, a huge part of helping me learn about it basically and setting me off on the right path. Um, so I'm ever appreciative of, of that. Um, but I guess um, something that I'd be interested to, to know um, it's kind of like uh, when it comes to Bitcoin, um, when you discovered Bitcoin, what was it? Um, what were the things I think, I guess, that kind of made you interested in it or excited about it per se? Um, so rather than just like the story of, you know, how you found it, what is it that actually kind of gravitated towards you about Bitcoin and kind of made you think, okay, well, this is, you know, important or interesting. And then maybe even made you think, okay, well, I'm then going to, step into this as like almost a career opportunity. Like what, what was, what were the things that kind of went through your head at that time? Well, I was a computer scientist. So obviously the technology was intriguing to me. I had never thought about these problems before. And once I read the white paper, I realized that the solution was rather elegant. Um, it was kind of backwards of how you would probably try to attack a problem like that and and that's you know why it was i think uh so so much of a, a leap forward is because it turned a lot of things on their head and um i actually ended up giving a whole talk about this a few years ago where i basically was making the argument that the the type of system that Satoshi Nakamoto created, it's basically a bureaucratic system, except it's an inverted bureaucracy, where instead of being this top-down hierarchy, it's actually a bottom-up type of uh, organic uh, consensus process. And you know, that's what uh, I think a lot of people misunderstood during the scaling wars, like trying to understand how governance in this type of system works. But at the time, I wasn't, I wasn't thinking about governance really at all. Um, other than the technology, the thing that was just most intriguing to me was thinking of money as an open source project. And the reason that I found that intriguing was that, you know, money is a concept that does not, or at least should not belong to anyone in particular. It is this collective agreement upon everyone who is using the money. So it makes sense to me that anyone who wants to should be able to uh, essentially chip in and voice their opinion about what they believe money should actually be. What should the attributes of a sound monetary system be. Um, if you want to contribute to working towards improving a monetary system, then I don't think anyone should be able to shut you out from that. So I think over the long term, that turned into this very interesting um, 
paths where we learned more and more about how the governance of a system like this works. And you know, government governance probably isn't even a good word for it because it really is more of an anarchic system where it's a system of rules where there are no rulers. And you know, that really throws a lot of people for a loop because there's there are not really many other systems that are analogous to that unless you're talking about kind of like meta concepts like language or um even religion is not a really good one because most religions have some sort of hierarchy to them um but something organic like i think language that is more um spontaneous and how it evolves over time um you know from a sort of mimetics uh, type of viewpoint i think that's a, a better type of organism that you can compare this to it's just this organism is um better defined i mean it is you know there is code in which we try to define it but 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 once again i think that confuses people because a lot of people think that um the the rules that your node for example are enforcing that you know that is the definition of Bitcoin, but I think that the definition of Bitcoin is actually um, ephemeral. I mean, it, it's just sort of floating out there, and the rest of us are trying to figure out what it actually is and codify it as much as possible. But I don't think that we'll ever actually be able to say for one hundred percent certain. You know, this uh, this current rule set is. Uh, Bitcoin, or it is what the uh, sort of optimal form of sound money is. I think that it's always going to be evolving over time. Well, so it's interesting to hear like the sort of perspective you initially had, and like how that how that grew as well, and the more you thought upon it. So, I mean, uh, were you would you have considered yourself a cypherpunk before you discovered Bitcoin, or was that something that came about because of your discovery of Bitcoin? I guess which came first? No, I was almost the antithesis of a cypherpunk when I learned about it, uh, because I was actually working for an online marketing company that was essentially just hoovering up raw analytics data. And my job was to build large scale cloud infrastructure systems that could analyze all of this data as quickly as possible so that our clients who were mostly online retail companies could better target people to sell stuff to them. Uh, that was not something that I found, um, you know, ideologically interesting. It just happened to provide some interesting technical challenges due to the scale of uh, the requirements uh, that, you know, as the company kept growing, as, as the data uh, that needed to be ingested kept going up by orders of magnitude. So if anything, that experience I think gave me an even greater understanding of exactly how much surveillance is happening on the internet just as you're going about your day-to-day -day business clicking around because I was the guy on the back end who was receiving a lot of that data and then helping people slice and dice it and um, use it to come up with... Um, new inferences about you know who you were and what you wanted jameson i wanted to ask you what are your thoughts on privacy wallets like wasabi um do you see a use case for them so the i think the difficult thing especially if we're talking about uh, on chain privacy the dif difficult thing is it's very easy to screw up um you know even if you are using a a a wallet that is primarily focused on protecting your privacy, then it it almost comes down to the UTXO level of you know how how well are you managing those UTXOs and how easy is it for you to accidentally correlate them together? So I don't know. I, I think that a lot of people may think that those wallets give them more privacy than they actually do, because I think it still somewhat comes down to what you are doing with the funds um, after they're leaving that privacy-based uh, wallet. So 
it's hard to quantify. Um, I certainly don't think they're bad, but it's, it's also, it's not really something that I use myself except in rare circumstances. And really the way that, that I tend to advise our own clients is that you, you probably are wasting your time if you're just constantly mixing your funds and in, in like thinking, oh, I'm becoming more and more and more private. Uh, rather, the way that I tend to approach it is if I want privacy for a payment, then I send that payment to the mixer and then directly from the mixer, I send it to the target destination. You make the payment from the mixer. Um, other than that, I, th I think a lot of this like constant mixing and uh, you know, constantly doing on-chain transactions is probably not buying people quite as much privacy as they, they might think. I'd be interested to hear what your um, opinions are on Monero um, as an option, because obviously it's considered a privacy coin. Um, and so I'd, I'd just be interested to see what you think of that or the future well i guess how how, how usable that is um for people um, especially over something like bitcoin which is pseudonymous and has some kind of privacy and security built to a degree into it but um not as much as, as monero does on chain well yeah i mean i think that monero is more user friendly if you want a really high level of privacy then you don't have to jump through as many hoops, basically, you know, um, I think that whenever it comes down to a user having to actually think about UTXO management, then we've really lost a lot of the, the UX on expecting mainstream people to ever be able to use something like that. So I am a fan of Monero and if anything, you know, I'm, I'm disappointed that it hasn't been adopted more than it has. And, you know, I'm not surprised though. I, I don't really, I don't consider it to be a problem with Monero as a project. I think it's rather, it's a reflection on society and just the fact that a, the vast majority of people don't think about or don't care about their privacy. Um, I certainly wish that we would see a lot more adoption of uh, networks that have stronger privacy, but um, I think f for the time being, we're just going to have to be happy with the uh, privacy conscious individuals that you know put in the time to do their own research and figure out w what tools are acceptable to continue pushing these projects forward. Well, I guess while I'm on the topic of altcoins, I might as well go down the go down this path. Uh, like something I um, saw you recently, because I, I follow you on Twitter on my personal account, and something I've been seeing um, fairly recently uh, was that you were looking into Solana um, and trying to be a validator or node, whichever way you want to go about it, um, on right. Solana. Um, and I, I just, I guess I wondered why you chose to look at Solana. Um, it's something that I looked into myself a little while ago, just to try and understand it, like what they're up to and what the aim was. Um, and whilst I can understand pretty much what they were trying to do, what the aim was, what it, what it did, I couldn't understand how it did it. Like proof of history, for example, this, this kind of consensus they bring up, I couldn't work out how it actually worked or I could understand yeah. what they're trying to do. So I guess I just was interested in like wh uh, why you chose to look at it and, and kind of what you've learned as well from looking at it. Yeah. I mean, I'm not singling them out. Um, this is actually a part of an annual uh, series of performance tests that I run. Now, this is the first year that I've ever run a Solana performance test, though I'm not sure if it even really existed a year ago. But obviously, the reason that I'm doing it is because, isn't it? I think it's a top 10 coin now. I, I basically, I try to cover, um, uh, yeah, it's like top 15. Um, but I basically try to understand, you know, all of these networks that... Uh, Basically, all of all of them in the top twenty are have market caps over like twenty or ten billion dollars. Um, so you know, if you if you're supposedly securing over ten billion dollars worth of funds, then I'm interested to know what is your security model. Uh, what can an end user expect? Uh, 
with regard to their self-sovereignty in the system? Uh, you know, how, how much power are they actually ceding to a third party or perhaps some sort of coalition? Um, you know, basically the, the model that Bitcoin has created is very well distributed in terms of power. And I think that people talk about decentralization a lot in this space without talking about what we're actually trying to decentralize. And it's the power. We don't want kings. We don't want tyrants. We don't want uh, small cabals of people operating behind closed doors to make decisions on our behalf. We already have that. It's called the banking system. So why the hell would we re-implement the same broken system or the same broken architecture? And that's what fascinates me with some of these coins because it seems like they're basically re-implementing the same type of architecture and essentially using this, what I would call either security theater or veil of decentralization, uh, creating enough obscurity that for the average person, they're not going to know any better. And they're going to think, oh, this thing basically operates the same way as Bitcoin. It just has these other additional features, which make it even better. And, you know, that's just kind of one of the things that I think that we need to push back against is a lot of uh, claims that that all of these altcoins are on the same tier as Bitcoin. And of course, there's a million different ways that you can slice and dice and try to compare the different networks and projects and so on and so forth. But to kind of bring it all back around to what I was doing, this particular uh, series of tests is a um, preferably full history validation of a, a given blockchain uh, performance test on a benchmark machine that I built uh, a little over three years ago. So I've been running these tests for th at least three years now. And the it's a very simple, straightforward test. Can I download a node for this network? Can I download node software? And can I configure it so that it's syncing the entire history of that network and and validating it you know not just downloading data but actually downloading the entire history and checking you know every transaction every block uh, to independently verify that no sh shenanigans have happened on the network you know this is the what i would call ultimate security model that bitcoin offers and not all of these other networks offer it, or if they do theoretically offer it, um, it is already outside of the realm of possibility for most people to actually do it. And what I'm referring to there is specifically any quote unquote high performance blockchain networks. Um, there's really no way around the fact that if you are creating a ton of data, if you're allowing people to create, you know, hundreds or thousands of transactions per second on an open network, then the resource requirements in order to validate all of that stuff are just going to go through the roof. And so what I am trying to understand in a lot of these cases is, you know, what are the trade-offs that they've made? How expensive is it, or is it even possible for a normal user to independently verify that no one is breaking the rules on this network. And some of these networks are really interesting uh, in how they've set stuff up. But most of the time, what you're going to end up finding out is that they are, they are creating much weaker security models and doing various things that they will call like fast sync or snapshot sync or or perhaps this proof of history that you were talking about <laughs> of you know uh they understand that it's no longer feasible to actually verify the entire history so instead they come up with a way that it's usually some sort of semi trusted if not completely trusted uh checkpoint that is you know in recent history 
And then you just download that checkpoint and verify a few attributes about that and then start rolling forward. And so with Solana in particular, I think uh, when I tried to run that node, it downloaded a checkpoint that was about two weeks old. Uh, well, only took about an hour for my machine to get through all of that, but then it was never able to actually catch up with the tip of the blockchain. And Solana was doing like 500 transactions per second. And I was basically watching it get further and further behind until eventually my machine crashed because it ran out of RAM and swap space. And to be fair, my machine does not meet the very high minimum technical recommendations required by Solana. I was just interested to see how far it could get. But um, you know, some of these other networks I've been looking at, uh, they don't even make the, the software uh, available. Or if they do, like I, I was looking at the internet computer uh, network because I think it's also gone pretty high recently in the stats. And they didn't have any built releases of their node software. And then when I tried to build it myself, the build, build failed. Um, and then the, the further that I even looked into it, it's like, even if I am able to build the software, they're not going to let me connect to the production network. And there's, uh, you know, they have a bunch of reasons behind that. And they seem to have created a, a security model for their network that is fairly unique. We've never seen anything like that. But as far as I can tell, it basically requires gatekeeping by the foundation that has uh, built this network and this protocol. And and I think that that is a common theme that we see across a lot of altcoins is that, you know, I wouldn't try to put a number on it, but a, a non-negligible number of these altcoins are really more like venture backed startups. And a lot of the aspects of the network architecture and control over the rules and the code and whatnot are essentially uh, centralized at a single point of failure, which is one company that has raised a bunch of money. And, um, you know, maybe they make various promises or, or plans about how someday it's going to become less centralized. Um, but I don't think there are very many good examples of networks that have become less centralized over time. Usually, uh, it goes in the opposite direction. So I would suggest that you want to start out as decentralized as possible. Appreciate that. Yeah, it's, it's one of the things that when I look at, because you often hear these fantastical ideas and genius thoughts, et cetera. But then when you go to look at the project from the get-go, it's like apply to be a node or apply to be a validator or something. And I'm like, well, like immediately straight off the bat, that's, that's a red flag for me. Um, and, and that was, I think when I looked at Solana, you had to apply, I think at the time, I don't know if that's still the case, but. Yeah, um, I think it is. And, you know, that's another thing, right? Is that as far as I'm aware, basically none of these high performance networks are proof of work based. So they tend to either be proof of stake or some sort of proof of authority. Like this is, this is why you find the gatekeeping coming into play because if it is basically setting up some sort of whitelisted consortium of validators, uh, I think that that's kind of like the, the ripple model. Um, and I think that, you know, a number of these other networks are essentially doing the same thing. Then, I mean, this is basically just a new type of social consensus, uh, except, you know, you have what is essentially a cabal that is saying, you know, we are allowing these people to be a part of our social group. And um, if anybody else wants to join, then you have to convince us to let you in. And uh, that's, uh, that sounds eerily familiar to some other systems out there. So, I don't know. I mean, obviously the market has said that there is some value in these things. I just think it's not what I value. And I don't think that they're going to be able to offer the, the level of uh, permissionlessness and censorship resistant that we can find in Bitcoin. A lot of these proof of stake blockchains, they're, they have like a lead investor, which is like a hedge fund. And the hedge fund will buy up like the majority of the tokens so that they can stake and that they can control the governance 
And then once they have pumped it, they'll dump the tokens on retail and then they go find another one to repeat the process. Yeah, I guess uh, with Algorand, I remember when I discovered it, I thought, oh, this seems like a really cool idea. It seems to work efficiently or whatever. And then I, I read into it and on their own website, they admitted like quite a few faults. Like you had to, you had to, uh, like their entire white paper was built upon the fact that two thirds of the validators, I think more than two thirds actually, the validators were completely honest. I'm like, well, that's quite a lot of people you have to believe are completely honest just to make this thing work. And so like, I remember bringing it up with some Algorand people on Twitter and you know, essentially it just got, you know, sh sh shut down. But um, yeah, I guess there's a lot of that in the uh, altcoin space, especially with the proof of stake. Well, I was just going to say, you know, you can create whatever security model you want. And if you can get enough people to buy into it and believe that it's safe, then you can accrue a decent amount of value. Um, and, you know, maybe... Maybe they are safe uh, as long as you know that hedge fund behind it keeps holding on to all of the governance tokens and doesn't act poorly. But you know, that um, uh, that's so similar to the existing system of you know everything works fine until it doesn't, and you you just you've created so much systemic risk that you know the potential for this edge case catastrophe is just constantly looming overhead. And unfortunately, unless that actually happens, it's it's really hard to argue with people that uh, they should be more worried about it. Can you tell us what's new with Casa? Uh, let's see. I mean, the most recent thing that we've rolled out is uh, our most highly requested feature, which is uh, sub accounts, basically letting people reuse their uh, existing hardware devices to create separate buckets uh, to be able to manage their Bitcoin. Um, and this is a common request for people who they, they may have different Bitcoin from different sources or have has different cost basis or different tax implications, or maybe some of it is, is owned by different entities. Um, you know, just things that you need to keep logically separated. We've managed to, to build that into our system. The, the, the tricky thing, I think, compared to a lot of other wallets that make it possible to create uh, various sub wallets is that uh, we have, uh, essentially a key rotation feature in Casa so that if you lose a device, you can actually swap it out and you know, go buy a new one and plug that one in. And that was one of the things that created a lot more complexity for a feature like this is because now uh, if you do that, you're gonna have to do uh, uh, more than one you know, Bitcoin transaction essentially in order to uh, migrate those funds over essentially from the old set of keys to the new set of keys. And we want to you know, make that as seamless and user-friendly as possible. Looking forward, we're excited about some of the new hardware devices that are coming on the market. Um, in particular, the thing that excites me from a uh, usability point of view are the air-gapped QR code-based devices where you know, you're not even going to have a USB cable to have to plug them into anything, but rather there's a camera built into the device and it, all of the data gets exchanged back and forth um, via a QR code standard. Uh, it, it appears that we have landed on the uh, blockchain commons um, standard for animated QR codes. They have a, a 1.0 and a 2.0 version. The 2.0 2 version is much more performant. And I'm hoping to see uh, all of these hardware manufacturers essentially add support for that. So when I talk about uh, these devices, some examples are uh, Keystone, formerly known as Kobo, uh, Blockstream Jade, um, and Foundation, I think are, are three of the, the first ones that are coming out. Now, uh, a downside I think that we're seeing is that be because these devices have more hardware, they're going to tend to be more expensive, at least early on. So some people may be a bit off put by the higher price point on some of them, though I think Blockstream Jade is, is quite inexpensive. But um, I think that this is going to really be like the next step forward in uh, you know, air gapped private key management. And so we're looking forward to being able to support as many of those devices as possible with CASA because one of the bigger pain points 
that our clients experience is having to uh, plug in a, a device to their computer and uh, do the signing there because it's basically a lot of complexity. Uh, you know, different operating systems, different browsers, different network settings. There's just so many things that can go wrong when you have to plug the device into the computer. Um, we feel like being able to get rid of the computer uh, completely will make uh, the user experience a lot more seamless and will make our support load a lot lower. Uh, looking forward more to next year, uh, that's when we're thinking about things like Taproot support, thinking about possible, you know, more complex type of Bitcoin scripting. I think one of the, the common examples that I give is something like a, a gracefully degrading time-locked multi-sig where if so many years go by, uh, the threshold requirements for spending from it will decrease. This is Theoretically, it's doable today, but Taproot will make it much more private, much more uh, performant because you won't have to reveal those scripts unless you actually use them. However, there's a number of trade-offs because you end up creating uh, redeem scripts that have non-deterministic data in them. And whenever you start doing that, that means your, um, your backups are, are going to have to be essentially refreshed you know, every time you generate a new address. So I think there's still a fair amount of work and perhaps some new standards that will need to be formed around that. Like, you know, everyone's excited about Taproot and being able to create more complex scripts, but I gave a talk at uh, the MIT Bitcoin conference actually last year where I was warning that we, we need to be careful as developers not to backslide and not to uh, throw out all the cool stuff about having deterministic wallet backups just so that we can have a uh, fancier type of Bitcoin scripts. So still, uh, I think a fair amount of work to be done, even at the, the protocol and sort of wallet standards level for that stuff. It's a two part question. Uh, I guess the first part is I'd really appreciate if you could just give like a, a really quick summary of what kind of what, what, what you do basically and what, what the product is. So obviously people out there listening can understand that. And maybe if they're interested, check it out. Um, and then the second part of my question um, was, I guess, where did the idea come from? Like what sparked the idea in, in you, I guess, to, to go ahead and work on it? basically as a project. Yeah, so the very short version of Casa is that we help people secure their Bitcoin. And really we're what we're focused on is people who have a significant amount of Bitcoin. So we are aiming to provide a level of both uh, security and redundancy and robustness not only against attacks, but against all forms of loss. Because to, to be quite honest, even, even though I think what you, you probably hear about in the space is various thefts or uh, criminality, the majority of times when people lose their Bitcoin, it's because of their own mistakes and simply just losing the keys due to uh, ignorance or natural disaster or, or what have you. And so what we've built at Casa is a system that it's, um, its main goal is to eliminate single points of failure so that you can't shoot yourself in the foot and make one mistake and have that one mistake be catastrophic uh, for your Bitcoin holdings. The way that we do that is with multi-signature technology, which means that when you deposit your Bitcoin into your Casa setup, uh, you cannot spend it with a single signature. Uh, we, we have multiple different uh, setups with different levels of security. Some of them require two signatures, some require three. And then the, the key set is distributed as well geographically so that you know if your house burns down, you don't lose all your keys. Uh, really, you should be having your keys in uh, multiple different places. Uh, we recommend like home or office or safety deposit box uh, for our, our premium tier customers uh, that generally have a three out of five key set. Then 
Uh, they'll have one key on their phone and then three different hardware devices of different manufacturers so that you're not creating a single point of failure with supply chains or uh, software or hardware. And then all of those will be in different uh, secure locations that are as far apart as you want. Uh, there's a fair amount of flexibility and customization that can come into play. Um, you know, it's, it's all about trade-offs between security and convenience here. And then uh, finally, CASA will hold one key offline, which we then have our own uh, recovery procedures for. If you want to request a signature from CASA, you'll have to hop through various types of authentication, uh, depending on what type of client you are. But the whole idea here is that if you lose one of your keys, it's fine you still have a threshold of keys in other places that you can use to spend those funds and then perform a key rotation, like I said, where you just go buy another device and uh, plug it in and essentially reconstitute uh, your key set. So that's just like a really high level, um, but we do a lot more than just provide the software. We're also really high service level uh, components. So especially at our premium tiers, like we'll actually get on the phone with our clients and walk them through things. Uh, we even have uh, emergency phone call support, emergency like big red button in the app if you want to lock everything down and you think something has gone wrong. Um, and it's really about peace of mind, I guess, from a, uh, a sales standpoint, the people who come to us are the people who have a lot to lose. And they, in many cases, don't feel comfortable with the really high learning curve of setting up your own key management system. Now, this is the beauty of Bitcoin is that no one can stop you. you you're, you're free to do everything yourself. And... Um, essentially recreate the same type of setup. Uh, but I would argue that we've made things uh, very streamlined and it's, it's possible for a novice to come in and essentially get onboarded in a number of hours, uh, even if they're not familiar with the uh, Bitcoin multi-sig or not familiar with the different Bitcoin hardware devices. So I, I think that this is a necessary requirement in order for Bitcoin to really go mainstream and do it in a way that is not you know, recreating the banking system where everybody is keeping their money on third party custodians and exchanges that uh, for me to help people help themselves is a way for me to actually strengthen the ecosystem as a whole to help reduce the systemic risk of too much concentration of Bitcoin in the few hands. So it is, you know, is a, is a personal mission, I think for me to try to help protect the whole system by helping individuals empower themselves. And it's also, it was spurred on by a personal need where I had been working at BitGo for three years doing multi-sig um, enterprise private key management, you know, helping secure exchanges and other large providers. And I realized that my own cold storage setup was just really onerous. And I was spending essentially a weekend every year updating my cold storage. And I felt like, you know, if I'm supposed to be the expert and it takes me this much time to do it right, or at least uh, to follow the best practices that I consider to be important if you're trying to secure large amount of uh, funds, then I felt like the vast majority of people were not gonna be able to go to that length. And so helping lower the bar uh, of requirements, uh, helping kind of get the, the, the steepness of the learning curve uh, a bit flatter is, is really just gonna be good for everyone. And you know, if we can, if we can you know, run a profitable business while we're doing that, then great. But in, even if not, then it's going to be helpful for the ecosystem as a whole. I got you. I appreciate it. Um, so it kind of yeah, it came from fixing a problem that you kind of foresaw for yourself or something that was, you know, a pain point or a frustration. And then I'm realizing, well, obviously that probably impacts a lot of other people or will do anyway. So building that out for them and offering that as a product. That's pretty cool. I appreciate the answer. Um, well, I guess we've been going for about 
an hour approximately as well. Um, I don't know, Ricardo, did you have anything else you wanted to ask? Um, no, no, I'm good. Thank you for uh, participating in the interview, though, Jameson. Yeah, really appreciate your time and uh, and also some of your answers. You've like kind of brought light to quite a few things I've I've had I've wondered. Um, so I really appreciate it. You bet. Thanks for having me. And also thanks to everyone out there listening. Um, and yeah, if they have any questions, obviously feel free to send them through to myself or Ricardo or Refill. We can always. Uh, try and pass them on to Jameson or answer ourselves but um yeah I appreciate uh, appreciate everyone and uh, everyone have a lovely day evening morning afternoon week whatever it is where you are take care and buy Bitcoin <laughs>